Welcome everybody. Give us a second to catch up. Make sure we have people in. If you are in, say hello to us. There we go. Fantastic. I see that you guys are here. Please say hi. We are back with another episode of Teal Talk. I'm your host, Media Vines Vice President of Marketing and Communications, Jenny Guy. And today I have not one, but two very special guests to talk about a topic that given the ever-changing nature of the internet in 2024 is very important. And that is email newsletters. We have all heard of these before. Between the direct connection they give you to your audience and the power they hold when it comes to collecting information, email newsletters are one of the key channels of communication that have always been important to publishers. But like we said earlier, the internet is changing. So what does that mean when you're building a powerful email newsletter today? And what value does it provide? I think that we will all agree that it is an especially valuable system of communication and identification. But today we're going to talk more about the answers on why it matters so much in 2024 and including a special offer for a class that teaches you a system that will take your newsletters and your brand to the next level, which I think we can all agree is a good thing. Let's meet our guests. John Dijkstra has been a niche site creator for over 10 years and has built an incredible portfolio over the course of the last decade. If you know the Fat Stacks blog, you know John. With an incredibly successful portfolio of 16 sites and a commitment to sharing knowledge with his peers and bloggers just starting out, John's a powerful voice in the blogging industry, and we are very excited to bring him to Teal Talk for the first time. Welcome, John. Oh, hey, Jenny. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. We are thrilled to have you. And Scott DeLong is a serial entrepreneur that's created and flipped multiple websites that have generated billions with a B of page views and tens of millions in revenue. He's a self-described introvert. He, and we are quoting him on this, hates meetings, raising money, useless reports, and just about everything you've heard of in the business world. We love honesty. What he cares about is making websites that are efficient and bring in money. And with features in outlets like Bloomberg, Business Insider, and Fortune, just to name a few, Scott's definitely proved that he has the goods over the years. We are very excited to have you today as well, Scott. Hello, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for overcoming your introverted nature and joining us on this live. We are very excited and we will be, we will be gentle. All right, let's start out here. Fundamental question number one, why is a newsletter important to a sustainable content creation business and what makes a great one? And we'll start with Scott on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously <clears throat> you had sent me this question before, so I had some time to think about it and I, I feel like it's sort of, um, it's asking things a little bit backwards to be honest, because, um, I think a newsletter should be number one. It's not that a newsletter is important to the business. It's that everything else might be gravy to your newsletter. So I kind of think of it the other way around where newsletter is number one, whereas I think most people kind of look through the eyes of maybe Google being number one, and then the newsletter becomes an aftermath, which to me for 15 plus years, it just never made sense because I can control one and I can't control the other one. Can't control Google and what they decide, but I'll always own my list. So to answer it more simply, um, just owning your audience in, 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 a, in a bigger picture, I guess, diversification as well. I uh, absolutely agree. And I do think that for most content creators, that is the opposite of the way that they they're thinking about it. And Luckily, we have a content creator right here who might be able to identify with that statement, John. Uh, yeah, well, I was 15 years after Scott realized <laughs> how fundamental they are. And I, I now, you know, I still think about like other sources of traffic. It's it's ingrained in me, right? But, you know, more and more I keep think coming back to, okay, the what's good for the newsletters? Focus on the newsletters, folks. And anyway, so, you know, it's working really well for me. I see it the way Scott sees it now uh, because it works. It's working for me. For years and years, it was Google or Pinterest or Facebook, which which are great, but they're great until they're not great and they don't work. And and that's the issue, right? So now I'm just like all in on the newsletter. Um, thanks to Scott showing showing me how to go about it. And I want to thank you, John. I want to follow up with Scott. What makes a good email newsletter? That's a big question. Um, yeah, it is. It's a very big question. I think um, the the 
the best way to describe it, even though it's maybe not the easiest thing to take and just make actionable is just how do you, how do you create something that people absolutely have to open every day, whether it's just because it's so good for, I mean, I, I tend to not want to create entertainment, strictly entertainment newsletters anymore because people are already distracted so much with, especially with the rise of things like TikTok, which have extremely addictive algorithms. Um, people just uh, don't really, I don't think they go through their email looking for entertainment, but they do open something that they know is going to directly help them in life, whether it's saving time, money, um, or, you know, something with a relationship, perhaps that's the kind of the, um, I think it was like Alex Hormozzi who said like health, wealth, and relationships are the things that people will always think about, care about. Um, but yeah, so, so it's a, a little bit of a vague answer, but it's just one that absolutely has to be opened or the person will go on with their day being like, oh, I didn't, I should have probably opened that. I would have taken a second to open and see. And like, how do you create an email that, that puts that in them? It doesn't mean that one can't work. That's just a little more, you know, enjoyable. It still works. I run stuff like that all the time. But um, the closer you get to that core kind of need that people have as far as um, their like inner peace is in, in solving a point each day with your, with your newsletter or every week, however often you want to send it. A um, little bit of a long-winded way of saying, um, make, make a good newsletter, I guess. I'm thinking, not really <laughs> It too, too well, but um, but yeah. So that's kind of the the basics, I guess. I love that idea of it being something that is must open, not supplemental, that sticks with them and makes them think throughout the day. Gosh, I should have just opened that email, John. How does that translate to your business? Yeah, I would, I, I would say. You know, I look at it, I kind of split it up like you got your your business newsletters, which is a totally different beast. And I've been running that for like years, right? Like business toward business owners. That's kind of a totally different thing. And, and that's why, like when Scott was showing me, hey, it's like, wow, I run these these great profitable newsletters, but it's not just to the business crowd because that's a very di different type of thing, right? We're not for focused sure. on driving the traffic back to the website. Usually my my business audience, there's, there's no links in there. It's just information. Like what Scott is talking about, let's give them information. But now he's he's turned it toward larger audiences, broader audiences in the terms of it's more of the B2C um, audience, not just people who are looking how to start a certain type of business. Um, so I distinguish those because I think it's an important distinction, uh, you know, because I struggled for a long time with my let's you know, I've got a, a home and garden site. Right. So I struggled for a long time to actually make a newsletter work in that. And Scott showed me how to actually make it work. I could always make a business newsletter work. That was pretty simple to do. But it was how do how do we now take you know, you know make it work with with different types of websites, which is a lot of people who are watching today have those types of websites. Maybe food or uh, home, um, fashion, beauty, whatever, right? Automobiles, right? So so the real question is how do we make them work for those traditional niche sites that relied so long on. Google traffic and maybe Facebook and Pinterest traffic. So, how did you do it? Tell us more. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, it, you know what? It was a lot of testing, right? I had to figure out. So it was, it was a two-part step. So I did have a list. It's a cold list. It would I could barely like ever emailed over the years, but somehow I had this list, and I was sending stuff, and I was just trying everything I could, like within within the realm of the niche I was in. I mean, I. Would I be in the same niche today if I were starting from scratch? I don't know. It's the website I had. It's the, it's what I had to work with. I wanted to make it work. I tested every type of content you can imagine. It's over and over and over. And I would look and see what got clicked and what didn't get clicked. And same with uh, subject lines that were getting open and those. Are, so anyways, I, I kind of figured it out. And I found a few topics that people really resonated with, like on, on a pretty pretty big scale. So then what I did is I completely changed how I was attracting subscribers and I, I align the message with what my newsletter is now about. I figured out, okay, my newsletter needs to be about this. The message to attract them to the newsletter was going to be tell them exactly that. Join the newsletter and you will get this type of information regularly. And so once I started doing that and all the pieces came together, my open rates, my click rates, like 
like really, really increase quickly. And so it, it really is trial and error. Love hearing the testing. And I think we'll get more into that in a bit, but want to, zoom in now on the elephant in the room for a lot of content creators right now, which is all of the various algorithm updates from Google that had kicked off last fall with the helpful content update and have continued to today. Um, Scott, that didn't impact you, I'm guessing, because you've never very much relied on, on Google traffic to have success with your websites. Yeah, um, since I don't really go to Twitter either, I, I honestly didn't even know what happened um, until I started getting emails from from people that subscribe to my my newsletter. Um, and I've written for years about how I don't build for Google. I just never have. I've gotten a lot of Google traffic over the years, but I don't I don't try to follow anything that says hey, if you you know bold seventeen words and put a table of contents, you know, every, everything. And, and even to this day, I go to, I go to groups on Facebook and people are still, they're just chasing like what they think Google wants. I'm, I'm seeing people, should I launch a forum because Reddit's doing, I'm like, no, you're looking at this completely wrong. Like you're looking at the entire idea of building a website wrong. You're, you're, you have a, you're chasing a tactic, which is to optimize your site for search engines. You're not building a real business. And I think I've just, I think I got a little lucky because it just bored me so much that I never did it. <laughs> and plus Facebook was, was fish in a barrel back in the day. So that was like very easy. And then obviously running newsletters and, you know, parlaying that traffic into, into email as well. Um, but I'm sorry, I can't remember your actual question. I kind of went on a little side note. No, I liked it. I want to, I want to, let me redirect with, what is the distinction for you between building for Google or a tactic and building a business? Talk to me about that. Well, it's, it's making a decision because you think an algorithm is going to like it and not a person. And I think that people over the years, because of the, the SEO kind of circle echo chamber all convinced themselves that they were doing stuff for the user, but really they weren't, they were, they were doing what somebody else in the echo chamber said, said work for them. And it, I, I mean, I don't, I don't have all the data by any means, but I think half that stuff was just coincidence. And then, then everybody started chasing what appeared to work. But again, I've never been in that world. It's just for, like an outside perspective. Um, but yeah, yeah. Your original question was how did it affect me? It didn't affect me at all. I guess it, it got me more subscribers to my newsletter because people <laughs> wanted to learn about newsletters. So, so that, that was, that was the only way that it really affected me. And, um, even the site that I kind of built sort of halfway in public recently, like Google traffic didn't drop at all. It's actually going up since, since the helpful content update. And I haven't spent a second thinking about, um, any on-site optimization or, or off-site. I don't buy links or build links or anything. So that's, that's yeah. Okay. Uh, John to you, how did helpful content update impact you? Oh yeah, uh, severely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was actually yeah. my site took the biggest nosedive after the September 2023 HCU. Uh, March, there was no effect because, well, you couldn't really go down any further. So um, it, in a way it was a good thing because that was, I don't know, seven months ago. So I've had seven months to adjust. And I realized pretty quickly that there wasn't really going to be a way to recover from that HCU. I just didn't really see it happening. So that's when I started looking into other avenues. Uh, but you, you know, for years, Google, I always, I always kind of liked, I, I like Google traffic a lot in terms of, I like the analysis side of it and looking for what people are searching for and publishing content for that. But I agree with Scott that like, you, you're kind of like straddling two 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 sides right you're you're, you're writing for a, a a computer and you're writing for people um and sometimes the two would work together but sometimes it wouldn't it'd be like you'd be writing on topics that like you would never send in an email for example right it's just basically because some people happen to be searching for it um it worked great until it didn't work great uh the reason i like newsletters so much now is because well, Scott's made them work for 14 years, so there isn't really a, it, it's an evergreen model. And I, I really do see that it will continue. And that's what I wanted something. I, you know, I, Google was a good run. Like there's no getting around. It was a fantastic run. I don't regret it one bit, but now I'm looking, okay, next phase. What, what is something that will like essentially 
just continue working, working, and working. And and for me, it's the newsletters. I think it's interesting that you said that because I've also, you know, kind of ridden the waves of Facebook and even Pinterest and things like that. But the the one thing that has been tried and true the whole time since 2010 was was newsletters in the same exact model that I use today that I use in 2010. It's it's literally identical. And I think that was whenever I started getting lots of emails from people that got destroyed by helpful content update, I just finally started reflecting on it. And I was like, yeah, my, my email stuff, I never have to worry about traffic. Traffic fluctuations are like five to 10%, maybe just depending on subject line and whatever that day's content is, but been so stable. And the acquisitions, um, two of the three largest ones, the, the buyers flat out told me, like, we wouldn't buy this without your email list because they were both approaching almost a million subscribers. And they were smart and they knew that if Google and Facebook pulled the plug, they still got something. So um, there's a lot of value in it. And I think um, to, to John's point, it, it still works. It's an evergreen model unless, you know, Gmail completely blows up how they deliver your email, which I don't see happening. And sorry, it's getting a little long winded, but um, I also think it's daunting to most people. So I don't see a situation where it gets really saturated. And I think the people that can actually you know, are up for the challenge and to do it and kind of, um, take what I, John and I are sort of teaching and, and run with it in their own way, I think will be, be poised to have, you know, all the freedom and flexibility that they, they had with Google and what made them fall in love with that, except maybe sleep a little better at night without worrying about, you know, waking up that it's all gone. Okay. Great answer. Um, I want to ask the audience what they're doing with email newsletters currently. I already saw a comment that someone said they send they want to send more than once a month, which is a good goal. But let us know how things are going there while that's happening. Scott, what is the system that you use? Tell, tell us what it is. We're talking around it. Let's talk about it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, most people know by now that, that I have a very detailed um, playbook that, that I sell obviously, um, that goes, you know, deep on everything templates and, and, and such. But I think, I think from the surface, I'm not sure that even like, for example, John, correct me if I'm wrong, even, even you, your eyes opening to it. Um, it, it's so it's kind of like simple, but it's not because it's just, it's just driving traffic from email instead of Google and Facebook, but there are ways to do that. And, and John was hinting on this too. Um, where you have to make sure that you're a quad, you're getting the subscriber for the right reason so that they follow through so that it becomes a part of their their every day or every week life to open it. Whereas one of the biggest problems in turnoffs people have had over the years with sticking with their newsletter is because they fundamentally started out wrong because they heard that they should put a pop-up on their entire site that collects emails and then they send a digest once a week and they looked at the numbers and they were doing, you know, 100K a week from Google and 1K from email. And they're like, why, why am I wasting? Why am I doing this? This is harder work and, um, and I'm getting a fraction. So, you know, some people pulled the plug completely. Other people just kept collecting emails and letting that form sit on their site. I don't know why. John, maybe you actually did that, but it worked out <laughs> for you. And actually, you're proof that you can revive a list, which has been interesting for me to, to witness you do that, which is, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, I just think, uh, again, I keep forgetting your original question, this, like, you know, this whole anxiety thing is, is a lot no, of you're fun. Good. You're, that, you, you answered it. It was great. So I started out with saying what the system is and you, you defined oh, right. it, yeah. which is yeah. it, rather than relying on Google for traffic, you are relying on email. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I don't look at, e I don't, like, I don't look at the way I do emails too much different than why people go to Facebook or Instagram and scroll and click on stuff. It's not that much different. You're just in control of the whole thing. Um, well, honestly, it's, I guess you could sort of look at it that way. It's like a little micro, a little micro niche Facebook kind of. So, I mean, that's, that's the system, but, but again, how you create the content, how you position it, what you're measuring. It, there's a lot of details that obviously go into that, but that is the basic, the basic system. And, and also another important part is to incorporate things into the email that people who don't want to just open and click out, click out, click out. Um, some people are happy to do that, but a lot of people maybe they just like just sending 
a digest of your latest articles is a very basic way of of doing it. And I think that just doesn't work very well. And I think that's also a turnoff to a lot of people because they didn't see any people just weren't clicking at the level that they need to make a dent in their traffic. But you can take that to another level and give them reasons to stay in the email, you know, like morning brew and hustle and these, well, I guess hustle links out to a lot of stuff, but like they're completely designed to keep you in the email. And I would say my model is a bit of a hybrid. Okay. John, would you add anything regarding the overall system? You know, I would, I would say like Scott right there described me like five years ago, right? Like collecting emails for no particular reason. Uh, and, you know, try it every now and then, but the alignment wasn't there. Nobody cared uh, about, you know, basically I would just load in a bunch of articles and, you know, I tried the RSS feed method, which is basically automating the whole process. Uh, now I put probably more time into the email creation than almost anything else I do. That's how important it is. I'm very particular about what gets included. And as the, the list grows and the revenue grows, I will spend more and more time. Eventually it will probably be like the only thing I do. Um, that's how effective it is. So uh, the, the, the system really is like, there's a lot of moving parts. Like it's not like SEO where you just crank out an article, hit publish and like move on. Right. Like, that a pretty low barrier to entry to get going. With email, there's a few more moving parts, but if you get it figured out, it's like there, there's really no limit with it. Um, but you really got to figure out what your people want to read. And like, look at the numbers, look at what's getting clicked. Like for me, that was huge. What's getting clicked? And I would go through every day uh, and track that and then find, you know, the the type of articles that were working and then just do more of that. Okay, we're getting some questions in here from our audience, so I'm going to put those up on the screen. First, Kelly asked, how do you gain email subscribers if your list isn't very big? Scott. Yeah, so my, I mean, my main method is is paid through Facebook, um, lead, lead gen ads through Facebook. But um, if you already have a website, it's great because you can start collecting from your existing traffic, obviously. If, if you've been hit hard recently, that's, that's obviously less people that you can kind of peel off. But, um, but yeah, it's, I think that it, it works the same way is it, you just, you need eyeballs on, on your ad, whether it's a, you know, I guess your own ad on your own website or Facebook acquisition. I've spent, I don't know how much, a lot on Facebook, um, leads over the years. They convert really well. I mean, they're very high quality if you do it right. And, can build an entire business off of that. And it's, it's actually, I, something that I really enjoy doing is I love to optimize. And, and I know John's the same. I like love to optimize based on analytics and get that like cost per lead down. And it's like really addicting whenever it's like, Oh, it went from 35 cents to 30 cents. And here's why. And, um, you do all that stuff, right. And you can, you can grow a list to a pretty decent size for not that much money. John, anything to add there? I do get, free traffic still quite a bit from Facebook and Pinterest. And so I, I do put in opt-in forms on my site and I test those. Um, the quick answer is the exit pop and the mobile pop-ups tend to work by far the best, like uh, better than the embedded in the, in the content itself or, or elsewhere. So if you're going to, if you do have traffic, those, those exit pops is as annoying as they are, they really work. Uh, but yeah, I then like, uh, Scott showed me how to how to buy and pay for leads. And that's, I would say four fifths of my new subscribers is now paid. And like you could scale like crazy. Once once you get it all dialed in, you just you just paying for it and spend as much as you can and grow it. Yeah. And I would encourage anybody who's getting traffic and and trying to get people to sign up. I, I think the thing that drives me crazy is how many um, site owners just put the whatever pop-up form on their site that everybody else is using and they don't really optimize it or anything. And there's a super quick story I like to share just because it was such a game changer, not only for a website I used to have, but honestly for my life, because it, it changed the trajectory of my revenue, which ultimately led to a sale, which changed my life. And, um, it was a video site and I, I, uh, everybody would just, you know, have at that, at that time, desktop traffic was still over 50%. It was like 2012 or 2011. And, um, everybody just had it in the right, 
the, the sidebar and I did too. And is, you know, I would optimize it a little bit, change the photo, change the colors. be like, okay, this is cool. I was getting, I was getting a ton of Facebook traffic and uh, I was getting maybe like 300 email subscribers a day, which, which was good. Um, and then one day I just was like, well, everybody's watching videos on my site. What if the sign up form was directly inside of the video player? Um, after the video ends, not before, but after it ends, because I've just enjoyed this video. Oh, I would like more of this. This was great. And I figured it out. It took me forever. It was, there wasn't a plug in. I, I wasn't even on WordPress actually. Um, and I, and I started getting 3,500 a day, 3,500 signups a day. Wow. It, it was a total, it was life-changing honestly. And, um, and so I, I try in my writing and my newsletter to stress like, don't just look at a number and settle for it. Like try to get something better and think outside the box and don't do what everybody else is doing because a, if it's working and everybody else is doing it, you're too late anyway. And usually everybody's just following something that really doesn't work that well, or maybe one person's doing it a little bit better and it's working for them, but not anybody else. So really looking at your, looking at your site and your content through, through fresh eyes, not through the eyes of, I have a website, like all these people, what are they doing? Um, can, can change your like your like entire um your entire change your life honestly and in at the very least improve your business absolutely okay i've got a few more questions here mary beth says i've been collecting email addresses via a form on my site for 15 plus years and i haven't sent any emails in at least five years help does that list have any value? My list isn't super niche. It's lifestyle with content targeted to moms. So I guess I don't know where to start. Um, Scott Hoppin. Yeah, I, I think if I read this before meeting John, I would have probably thought maybe maybe it's hopeless. But I think John's experience show, showed me otherwise. Um, wonder if you have, sorry, I'm just reading it again. I don't know. Maybe John, you want to you want to chime in on that one a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, work with it. Do do what you can. Figure it out. Um, here here's sort of once you test. Um, it's it's a a mom oriented website or lifestyle site. So you probably cover a lot of different topics. So send out one email every day. And and even if you have to say, hey, it's been a while since I've emailed. I'm you know firing up the email newsletter again. Just give them a heads up and try all different topics and you can even mix them up in the same email or like one day do one type of topics the next day or the next and then see what gets clicked the most and eventually you'll find something that'll probably get a lot of clicks that'll be a topic you want to start focusing on uh daily and and you know we're talking about this as a system it really does take daily emails because that's how you're going to get the volume to your website and i do that and i know it sounds crazy to some people but people don't mind. They they will open every day and they'll be happy about it and they'll click. And so once you figure out what they like, then just publish an absolute ton of that content and do more of it. And then look for another topic that, that will resonate with people. But then be sure to change the messaging on the way you attract subscribers to your website. If you have pop-up forms or whatever you're using, say, you know, join a newsletter to get information or to learn about X, those topics that you have found that people like. And then your new subscribers are going to, you know, basically be clicking because that's what they signed up for. And lastly, after you send emails for maybe 30 to 60 days every single day, scrub that list. And that means you'll get rid of all the people who haven't opened any of those emails. Clearly, they're not interested. And that'll that'll help improve your open numbers and, and your the health of your list. Anything to add to that, Scott? Um. Not really. I think whenever John was talking about making sure that your signup form on your site is very relevant to what you're going to be sending, um, just take take off your marketer and entrepreneur hat for a minute and just browse the internet and look how many how many newsletter forms literally just say get our newsletter or some vague variation. Like nobody nobody wants that. Like nobody. And then people are like, yeah, newsletters don't work. Like okay. Like, you know, they don't work because you're just saying, get our newsletter. Like nobody cares about you. They care about what you're going to give them. Like, you know, so um, describe what you're offering and describe it from the standpoint of what they're going to gain. Not like, like, oh, I, I love to share tips for whatever. It'd be like, you know, word it 
differently of you're going to receive this that's going to make your life better. Um, so I, that's something I would add to what John said. Great. Okay, Kim said, how often are you sending newsletters to B2C versus B2B? I have a B2B list and I'm starting a new list for B2C. Scott, hop in there. Yeah, um, I've always sent B2C daily, um, at least every weekday. Um, my first large newsletter from a while back, um, I was sending Monday to Friday. And then I was like, let me send on Saturday and Sunday. And I made two, seven, two sevenths more money because I sent <laughs> two more days out of seven a week. So John's right. The more you send, the better. And I think, I think to, to really reiterate that that's what turns people off. People are like, oh, like, how am I going to send a newsletter every day? And it's honestly not that difficult. You just put it together and send it. Like it doesn't take that long once you get the system down. Tell us more about your system because I think that is something that is daunting to people. How long are the emails that you're sending? Once you've identified, saying that you've identified a topic like John was talking about that really resonates with your readers. Tell us more about that process. Well, it kind of depends on the person. Like if you've already got a library of content, you've got a head start, which is great. If you're starting totally from scratch, that's also fine, but you kind of have to create the content that you're sending people to as you go. And um, obviously, there are a lot more, there's a lot more to that, but building out a template makes everything so much more tangible. It's like, okay, so I know I start my email with this friendly intro and then my featured article, and then I'm going to have like, you know, whatever, a tip of the day, whatever, whatever it might be. Then it just becomes very, it just becomes compartmentalized and much simpler. It's less overwhelming than like, how do I send a whole email every day? That sounds like a lot of work, but once you break it down into digestible sections um it becomes pretty easy like i've got one that i'm just i don't work on it very much um i'm not exactly working hard on it and i've just set aside three hours every monday morning and i'm scheduling out the whole week and that's it it's like three three hours schedule out the whole week and you know it makes a few grand a month and it's i mean it's just it's just not that hard now granted i've been doing it for over a decade so obviously <laughs> i have an advantage but um i think once you kind of get in there and start testing stuff to what john said you, you start getting all this feedback and well that's actually one more thing i wanted to say um what john said about figure out what people are clicking and do more of that is 100 percent right but the other side of that i've talked to a lot of people who get really turned off because people aren't clicking something and that's just as important because you're just you're, you know you're learning what isn't working too mm -hmm. so if you put a whole bunch of stuff in there and it all fails it fails you know like it's not really failing you now know that they don't want that stuff so so try something different like treat treat even treat unsubscribers as a positive because it's somebody you're not going to pay for that didn't want to be part of your your uh your newsletter anyway so not failure, information. I like that. Okay. How are you making money from the newsletters? Is it from product mentioned in the newsletter or from the traffic it drives to your site? John, you hop in there. Yeah. Well, this, this was what blew my mind when I met Scott is it's basically really focusing on driving readers back to your blog, which is for me, my, my blogs are uh, monetized with Mediavine ads. So th that's it. It's as simple as that. Now here's the really cool thing because First off, ConvertKit, and I believe Beehive, I'm not entirely sure. I use ConvertKit. They're rolling out an uh, in-email ad program. Now, they're not super lucrative, so don't like, get super excited. I'm running them uh, not too aggressively because they're not super lucrative. But I think this is a start where this will be injecting a lot of money in, in email newsletters down the road. The other thing that's really good, this is making a lot of money, is uh, Mediavine's new uh, Email Connect um, it's brand new. I started using it last Friday. Uh, it has dramatically increased the revenue from visitors from my email newsletter to the blog. And they have to be from the email newsletter, which is great because now I've got a mechanism to like really dial up the revenue from, from email. And, and it's not from elsewhere. I, I wish I could put these links on Facebook and, and Pinterest, but I can't. Uh, that'd be great. But anyways, it's from email. So really, it's, it's display ad revenue 100%. You know, and and but that's that's a, a big distinction between like B two B and B two C. B two B, I would I would never send a, a blog for ad monetization. I would I would promote things more as an affiliate or, or sell info products. But for B two C, that mass volume traffic back to your blog 
earning from the ads on your site. That that's that's what I love about it. It's a traffic source that you're not that isn't subject to all the algorithms. And that is exactly what we're looking at here. And then you have a monetization partner like Mediavine and that's you're getting paid for those. And then we had a great question from Christina. She said, can you go over this new feature, please? Uh, John, it's a grow feature that we just put out. Would you talk a little more about how you're using it? And yeah, totally. It um, they sent an email, like basically it depends. It's a custom link you get and you got to grab the, the grow link. So you need grow activated, which I use. And then you grab the link and you, and you create a custom URL depending on your email service provider and, and, the, and the main ones were covered. It's in the documentation. So every, I, I, I put a lot of links in my newsletters to, to get a lot of clicks. And so, yes, it adds time to my creation of these newsletters, but I will create that custom link for every single link. And it has made a huge, huge difference. I really encourage you to dig up that email from Mediavine because they sent it out this week and go to the email connect documentation page and try it because like I started at last Friday and I noticed the difference that day. And I only did like one third of my links with those links. I just wanted to see it. Now I do every link. Thank you, John. So we are talking about one feature that has come out with grow is copy link. <clears throat> and with copy link, uh, we know that advertisers pay more when they know who they're talking to. And copy link is a grow feature where you, when you're composing your email, you're getting a custom grow link instead of the link that drives directly to your email. And if a reader has a grow account, when they click on that copy link, they're going to be uh, logged back in, which means they're authenticated traffic. And then as they travel around to all the other grow sites, every publisher is benefiting from those higher earnings from that reader. What email connect adds onto that is that if you're using MailerLite, MailChimp, Flowdesk and ConvertKit, you're adding a suffix onto that copy link, which bounces them through your email service provider and identifies them whether they have a Grow account or not. So when they're clicking those outbound links in your emails, they're going to be identified and we're going to get those higher CPMs from those readers. So we are going to send those, uh, check out those emails. Everyone should have them. We'll be providing more information about this. This is a hot off the presses feature. So what we're saying is if you don't have a Grow, if you're not using Grow yet, use Grow and check out some of these new features. They're definitely going to enrich your earnings on those new, on those, everyone who's clicking out from your email. And John, while we're on the subject of Grow, can you talk more about how you use Grow on your sites and how they work together with your email, with this new business model? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, yeah, you folks have told me, and you know, Eric as well, that, um, you know, the, the best subscriber are those who actually join Grow, like sign up to Grow uh, visitors to the website. So uh, I created, and, and this is tips from Mediabind really, was I kind of, you know, uh, you know, in my welcome email, I say, hey, join, join the Grow. I kind of spin it more like it's a, a feature of my website because my logo is on there on the sign up page for Grow. And I say, well, this is a premium version of my site. You can bookmark. Uh, blog posts and so forth. So I try to sell it, right? And I send them to a dedicated sign up page with my logo on there. And if they sign up, then now those readers are in Grow and they're going to, every time they revisit my site, which is for some of them daily, was going to generate a higher ad RPM. So I really try to sell the Grow. And for those who don't get into Grow, because let's face it, not 100% of people will do it. I use the email, email, I think email connect is called the the special mm -hmm. URLs we we're just talking about. So that's my backup. But anyways, the two together, I've created some pretty crazy ad RPMs for me from my email traffic, much higher than Pinterest and Facebook. We love hearing that. And yes, you're absolutely right, John. We know that not everybody is going to go through the trouble of creating a Grow account. Um, and that's why we're creating features like Email Connect that makes it easier to identify those readers. Uh, we have a question here. Um, Robin Perryman says, do newsletters work well for people under 30? If not, will newsletters ever really reach that generation? And we had someone else asking about this as well. Scott, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really see why not. Um, I think a lot of, uh, there are a lot of newsletters out there that are geared toward people under 30. I mean, I, I, I believe even something like Morning Brew probably has a fairly substantial reader base in, in their 20s. I, I, I don't know exactly the 
context of the question, but it does remind me of about 12 years ago, whenever everybody was declaring, you know, email was dead because young people don't, don't use it. And, um, that's when I, I was sitting on a pretty large list sending emails daily and like, we, was everybody talking about email is dead, you know, and that's another thing that goes back to like ignoring what everybody's saying is, is the, is the trend. But, but I guess to, I mean, I don't have like super hands on data and I don't generally create newsletters for people under 30. So I don't think I'm fully qualified to definitively say yes, but based on just observation, I, I feel like a lot of people are, are making it work. I think it's, yeah, I think it would all also depend on what topics you're writing about and if that's mm -hmm. where you're, or yeah, I think there's ways to find it. John, how about you? Would you add anything there? Yeah, my, it's not, <laughs> not a niche I, I have. My audience is, is a little bit older for the most part. So I, I really can't say, I, I don't see why not though. I mean, email serves a purpose for anybody, especially working um, people, right? We all, email is still for me fundamental with work. And I think for most people that work, email is there. So I think email is still very relevant and I wouldn't not choose a niche or leave a niche because the audience is mostly under 30. I'd really give it a shot. I think, I think it may work. I think some of the large, yeah, so, um, oh, I think, oh, sorry about that. I think some of the yeah. large, uh, I assume the crypto newsletters that blew up a couple of years ago, Milk Road and stuff. I assume there were a lot of people under 30. Um, and I know that sold for, I don't know, seven figures, some something. I don't know what it sold for, but a lot of money. So it can work, just depends on the, the niche. Okay. Uh, give it a shot. And please report back, Rob, and let us know how it goes. Uh, I mean, we can't get away from email even when we want to. I don't, I don't think that that is an age specific. No area we have to we all have to email if we want to exist in the world so um okay i want to get specifically into testing and optimizing emails john you talked a bit about looking for topics particularly when you're reviving a list that you have scott do you have any insight on how you test topics and place link placement and your templates give us give us the lowdown i mean i think john kind of already said this but i mean one of the beauty, one of the beauties of email is that you get such quick feedback. Like you can watch your metrics in almost real time, depending on the ESP right. that you're that you're uh, using. So for me, it's it's literally just about milking something that's working, and and if it starts to run dry by then, you've tested enough other pieces of content that you know what what people might enjoy, and then you just kind of milk that topic and just. Just keep giving people what they want because it's beautiful because you know what they want. You don't have to write an article and then wait months and months and see if it catches on for some reason. Um, you know right away. So um, it's, it's quite, it can be pretty, pretty addicting. It can be really enjoyable actually to just, I mean, I know John and I have, we exchange, you know, WhatsApp messages and talk about this kind of thing. And um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's crushing it with these same strategies. Just a, a quick sidebar I thought was hilarious. A couple of days ago, he gave me some updated numbers and I was like, I was like, what are you doing? He's like, just following what you told me. <laughs> it's like literally what you texted me said. back. Was, he's like, I'm just following what you told me. I was like, wow. And it's, you know, he, he's obviously running. I am a genius. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe planted the seed, but he's, he's running with it. And um, yeah, a lot can be done with it. If you, if you jump into the numbers and don't, don't think that email is this super scary, scary thing. I talked to a lot of people who are just scared to go that route. I think there's something comfortable about writing for, for, um, with Google traffic in mind, because you can just kind of focus, write your content and then, you know, do everything right. And then maybe it, maybe it works. And then, you know, but, but email feels, it just feels so much more personal, but that's because it is, and that's why it works. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, I don't know how people can kind of push through and get over that, but that's, that's what I try to, uh, show people that they can do. John, anything add, to add to that in your terms of your testing process and reviving that once dead list resurrection? You know, I would I would get on as many email newsletters in in your own niche and and, and if you're starting from scratch, like niches you're considering and and see what they're doing. And I don't have to copy them, but you get ideas. Um, of course, you don't get their numbers, so you don't know. But um, you know, my my focus was trying to make it work with an existing cold list and already in a chosen niche. So I sort of had to like figure out 
the, the content that would work for that. Whereas, you know, for, for somebody starting from scratch, they'll be like, okay, well, I know exactly what niche I want to cover. Now I just got to go find the audience that is going to uh, appreciate that content. So that's kind of like the opposite. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it kind of depends where you're at. Um, a lot, of, a lot of just testing and it's really frustrating. Like five years ago, I would send two emails and just like Scott said, I get, I get like 300 clicks. So uh, this is, this is nonsense. Everything else works way better. And I would ignore it. And now I think, you know, had I just had I met Scott five years ago and figured this out five years ago, I mean, I'd probably have like millions of subscribers. It'd be amazing. But anyways, um, it, it really did take me a lot of testing though this time around. I was, I was, Scott, Scott was sort of like validated. He sort of made it because he's done it like, I don't know, six or seven times he's built these things up. So when I, once I realized like I, it, it's possible because I'd never met anybody before who had done it in the B2C realm. I just, I just didn't. And when he was showing me numbers and, and explaining how it works, as soon as I believe like it's possible, I didn't stop until I started making it work because I, I was going to work. It was like SEO. I just kept going at it back in the day until it worked. Okay. So what you're saying is what I'm hearing is expect there to be some things that don't work as well trial and error keep going through it keep plugging at it until you find what's resonating and then do more of the thing that's working it does sound like seo <laughs> yeah uh... without google uh so bonnie and we had another question earlier about auto mailer i don't know scott if you're familiar with this feature john i believe you are but it is a growth feature they said it sounds like our speakers would not be fans of auto mailer the weekly automatic newsletter that can be part of grow Thoughts. I have a few thoughts, but John, are you familiar with auto mailer? Yeah. And, and I'm, I don't use it, but I think for the right type of blog, it would actually work really well. It works on an RSS, right? Jenny, basically. Actually it's RSS plus it's much better than that. So it will okay. share out the newest content, but it also leverages data from that reader and sends them posts that they'd be likely to enjoy. So it's a more customized, personalized, uh, RSS feed. Yeah. So I think if you were sort of controlling your content, every, see, I got content that goes on my website. That's not necessarily for the newsletter. It's for sure. Pinterest and other traffic sources. So I wouldn't want those scooped up and put into the newsletter, but if every piece of content, and I, I'm not very good at like we bulk post, um, you know, so it's not, I'm not consistent daily either. And but if your blog is like, you're controlling your content in a very sort of scheduled manner, and every piece you publish on your blog is going to go into your newsletter. I think actually testing like auto mailer or RSS concepts could actually work. And I know of some websites that do it really, really well. So I think it can work. It really depends on how you go about scheduling and publishing your content. Thanks, John. I, I also want to add auto mailer is definitely not meant to be a substitution for a highly personalized curated daily email. Auto mailer is really great when we've got some of the people in our comments who've been collecting subscribers for 15 years, but not sending anything or don't have the time to focus on it right now for their business. It's not meant to be a one-to-one -one substitution for all of the wonderful uh, advice we're getting today from John and Scott. If you're ready to go all in on email and write an email a day or three a week, um, Auto mailer can potentially supplement in there. So I would test that out to see how it works. But for those who aren't ready to go all the way in on email, auto mailer means that you're not, not sending something to your subscribers. And we're always doing things on our end to increase click through rates, experiment with all of that to drive as much traffic as we can. But this is a very different methodology. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we have another question here. Brian says, what do John and Scott think about reusing evergreen content in newsletters? Mm -hmm. I reuse links back to articles on my site <laughs> after six months. John. Yeah, you know, I haven't been running it long enough to actually do this, but I think about it. And I think, you know, obviously you're going to have a lot of new subscribers. And so that'll be fresh to them. You Maybe a lot of your other readers have left or they forgot. Hopefully they just forgot about the article <laughs> and it's new to them. I don't know. You know, I haven't really tried it, but I suspect at some point it may come to that for me too. Um, you know, um, 
I, I think give it a go. And if if people email you and say, hey, you sent me this already. Why are you sending it to me again? That's a pretty good sign. Maybe, maybe not the best thing to do. If several people do that, not just one. Yeah, true. Scott, yeah. how about you? Yeah, um, I have a more direct answer. Yeah, you can reuse stuff. I've been doing it for years. Um, the 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 open rates, you know, you see this open rate and you see like 35% of people open and it's not the same 35% of people. They're in a different space one day, so they're not going to click. The odds of somebody, a lot, a majority of the people not having seen it, pretty high. Um, and I've never once had any complaints or anything. Now, one thing I do like to do is always have like something fresh you know, at least keep something that's brand new, whether it's an article or even even something that, that's not an article. Um, and that kind of goes back to that sort of hybrid model that I like where it's not all just driving people out, but there's reasons to come into your email um, if you never click anything out. Because while you're there on, you know, six months later after something was shared, maybe that time it catches your attention. I've never had any any problems. And sometimes it gets more clicks the second time. And granted, usually that's because your list is hopefully grown by then. But to John's point, there's a lot of people who haven't seen it. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't be afraid to reuse reuse articles, especially um, after six months. I think that's totally fine. That's kind of what I do, to be honest, about six months. I would also say, just piggybacking off of all the great advice you guys just gave, readers don't use your site the way you do. They are not looking at, or your email, they're not thinking, oh, old news, they sent this five months ago. Mm -hmm. They're not going to remember your email from five months ago, particularly if you're sending five emails a week, six emails a week, three emails a week. I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, so I am definitely not going to be going into my email going, God, this is such an old link. Um, so it's great if it's great content, especially if it performed well, chances are it'll perform well again. But like John said, always test. Uh, so with, oh, Scott, go. I was just going to agree with you because, um, I sometimes think about like the worst case scenario is I accidentally send two emails at once, for example. And I just have in my head, all these people just being like, what is going on? And just max ex mass exit exodusing. Mm -hmm. And then whenever it happens to me as a subscriber to somebody's, I'm like, oh, that's weird. Delete. And I just move on. Like, I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care at all. It doesn't even bother me a second, yeah. like for a second. So you're hundred percent right. We care a lot more than, than yeah. they do as far as the, those little things go. Well, yeah, we don't use our sites. That, we look at things very differently than a reader does. We're a blip in their radar. We want to become more mm -hmm. than a blip. That's the goal. But yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the reason I want to get to, we've, you guys have provided so much great information and we've had great questions from the audience as well. But I want to talk about the fantastic system that you guys have collaborated on, which Scott, uh, Scott already alluded to, which is the Million Dollar Newsletter Playbook. Um, we talked about well, let's let's get into why you created this in the first place, Scott. Uh, John basically forced me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. After after I worked with John, because um, he has experience with with creating courses and stuff, and it's something I've actually written about disliking courses just because so many of them are just regurgitations of things that you can find for free. And um, you know, I don't remember our exact conversation, but it was just a very synergetic play because I just helped him and he was just like, yeah, people, and, and it actually, we started having this conversation sort of after the helpful content update came around and people were just more interested anyway. And um, I, I've written tons and tons of stuff for free. I just kind of enjoy writing on my site and my newsletter, but this was a huge undertaking to take 15 years of experiences and put it into, you know, a, a pretty lengthy course slash playbook, whatever you want to call it, that I'm very proud of. And that's why I kind of went down the route of, of feeling okay about selling something just because it is, it's a, I mean, if I would have had it a long time ago or to John's point, if he would have had it five years ago, um, who knows where he'd be sitting right now. And um, I, I'm kind of hoping down the road, somebody emails me and tells me that they've built like a whole empire just based off of that, because I feel like you can, it's all there. I'm too lazy now to do it, to be honest. Like I've, I've been doing this for a long time. So um, yeah, but uh, hopefully that answers kind of the, the basic question. It did. What what do we get with the million dollar playbook? Yeah, it's 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 honestly, it's it's, it's like everything I've done. It's all, the, it's, it's the templates that I use. It's the, how to create, you know, like a Facebook ad that works really well, how to take your existing traffic and parlay it into subscribers, how to 
basically continue to create content that works. Um, it's, it's sort of a deep dive in how to keep that person from inception all the way through to becoming a loyal subscriber and, and doing it in a way where you can retain your lifestyle because we, we all do this because we want a flexible lifestyle. Like nobody, you might as well get to, go get a job if you're going to do something that you hate and is daunting. And I think that this, this playbook eliminates all of that sort of fear and anxiety and, and dread because it, uh, and again, to John's point about once he saw that it was possible through our conversations, look, he's just like running with it and like blowing away what I would even, even have expected myself. So, um, yeah, it's just like, it's all there. Real examples, by the way, everything like real newsletters I've built, actual screenshots, everything, um, over the years, uh, one in travel ones in religion. Um, you know, so it's like, it's a, uh, pretty diverse look because I know people have many different niches and people are interested in, in different ones. There's what I think is a pretty amazing breakdown of, uh, ideas that I think will work really well. And again, there's, there's ways to like take your existing website and make it email friendly. Cause a lot of people who have written for Google over the years, the content's not really something that works in email, but that doesn't mean you have to totally abandon your niche. So, um, John, I, probably forgetting some stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, you have a really great list of niche topics you talk about with really in-depth examples and how you'd go about it. And I found that like one of my favorite parts of the whole thing. Um, I, I think there's almost, regardless of what niche you're in, you could probably like get ideas from that list you provide and apply it to whatever website you have now. Uh, that was super helpful. The, the fact that you show your past successful newsletters was huge. People can go check those out. And um, some of those sites are still going concerns and still successful. And you can, you know, go and see how it's all done. Uh, you know, for me, the most, the, the highest value aspect was how you go about getting paid subscribers. That was a piece of the puzzle I didn't have. I didn't even know it was possible when I tried it on my own five years ago. I was paying literally 10 times what I'm paying now just by doing what you showed. And that actually makes it financially feasible and an economic model that works. Before what I was paying, I would have never recouped that money. Like I've just been throwing my money away. So those to me were like super, super important um, in there. Christina says, is the playbook good for absolute beginners and does it help with how to organize email funnels on the back end? Scott. Uh, I actually created it with beginners in mind, people who didn't have any um, existing site. And then I ended up going back and adding that in because I assumed, or, or I think through talking with John, you know, we just sort of like, oh yeah, a lot of people probably already have websites. They're not starting from scratch, but yeah. So it's created with the beginner in mind. I will say it doesn't, it, it's not going to walk you through things that you can just search the, like how, like a tutorial, like not the super, super basic stuff. So for example, how to send a broadcast on through ConvertKit. Like I don't cover that because you can just go to ConvertKit and they have a much better write up. So I guess it's not absolute, absolute beginner. Um, but yeah, it's definitely aimed, uh, I wouldn't say aimed toward beginners because anybody can, can run with it, but it is with beginners in mind. And that's, and that's a big reason why I did all of the niche ideas. And I even included ad creatives that I would launch. Um, just examples. I never actually launched them, but what I would do and where I would start. So it's uh, it's really, really designed to get you get you moving in the right direction, no matter what stage you're at. And we had a question from Taylor Kaiser who said, does this walk you through how to actually set up the paid ads and what kind of ads to use? It actually it actually does um, mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was just in John basically told me, yeah, you need, yeah, we didn't say you need to do that, but he encouraged me to do it because that part was so important. So there's a full like 20 minute video every step of the way, as far as setting up the paid ads and yes, what kind of ads? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's all there. Fantastic. Okay. And we are very excited to bring this to our publishers. It's currently only available to Mediavine Publishers. We'll be sharing, or two people watching this broadcast, and we will share that link out there. And as a special treat, we have a bonus lesson that, John, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, yeah. Well, what I did is I put together some some of my best tips um, with, a, with a video screen share of um, basically my best on-site pop-up forms for attracting subscribers. And 
give you an idea of how I completely align my messaging with what's in the email newsletter. That to me has probably been one of the, the best advancements I've made in the last few months doing this. It's just changed everything. So um, that's a bonus. And then um, another one is uh, you're going to get an opportunity after a week or two to submit any questions you have to Scott through a form. And Scott will then answer those in a Loom video. It won't be like a, a live Q and A. Instead, he'll do it on a Loom, and it'll be a recorded video that will be sent out to everyone. Super valuable. That's that'd be really nice because once you get a chance to go through it and you start, you know, kicking the tires, you you may end up with some questions that you'd like to run by. Okay. Lastly, what is the pricing for our audience members today, and where can they find the course? Uh, it's four ninety seven. I believe is are you providing a link jenny we had yeah it'll be we will okay thanks yeah it's 497 that's like launch pricing it's it's not going to ever be lower than that fantastic and we will also share out the link to the bonus loom and if they when they have those questions where do they need to submit them for scott if they purchase the course we will make sure that everybody who gets gets it through mediavine will get a form emailed to them it's not going to happen today. We're going, to, we're going to give this a little while. We want everybody to get a chance to go through it, try things, and then we will send out an email and you can fill out the form and submit your questions. And then Scott will take uh, some time to put together the full video. So give give that a little while. It is no good getting it right away because you haven't really gone through anything. And this is going to be available until April 19th at midnight for our uh, for our audience today. And is that midnight Eastern? Uh, Pacific. Pacific. Perfect. A few more hours there. So it's actually April 12th for some people. That is a relief. Uh, guys, we'll be sharing all those links for you in the comments. And we'll also send out a follow-up email to make sure that you have access to everything and all of this great information. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us today, Scott and John. This has been so helpful. Uh, and we'll be post, like I said, the link's coming and we are very excited to see where everyone goes with their emails in 2024. Any last words or bit of advice, Scott, to share? Um, I would just say, you know, as far as the, this course goes, I mean, I put everything I can think of into it. I think it's great, but whether, whether that's something you buy or not, um, pay attention to email at the very least go go mess around. Even if you've got a few hundred subscribers or whatever, like just get in there and mess around and then you know, our, our offering is here. Well, it's here till, until the 12th, I guess. So I shouldn't say it's here when you're ready, but, um, but yeah, I just think it's, it's great. I mean, again, I've, I've been doing this for a long time and email is that like safe feeling as safe as it gets on, on the internet, put it that way, as far as traffic source and revenue. And it's, it's, it's good feeling. Awesome. John, anything from you? Yeah. You know, I, I know it sounds like a lot of testing, testing we talk about and building this up. But I don't know if, if you got a lot of traffic from SEO over the years, like that wasn't overnight either. I tend to forget that, right? Because we sort of built things up, but it really took me a long time. And I know most people that I know have done well with SEO in the past. It took a while. So this is not going to happen overnight, but if you really, really like work at it, like my results have exceeded my expectations already. I'm quite pleased about that. And so I just see like, there's really no limit with it. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing all your information. We are always looking for new ways to drive traffic and love that it plays uh, dovetail so nicely with Grow. Everybody have a wonderful rest of your April and uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, thank Jenny. You.